Okay, with me today, folks, is uh, Detective Angelo Parisi. Um, he's a retired detective from the Metropolitan Police Department here in Washington, D.C., and he's with me today to talk about a fascinating new book that he's written called uh, Mafia Bagman, The uh, Life and Times of a D.C. Mobster. And uh, uh, Detective Parisi, this is the uh, Mafia Bagman, right? Yes, that's Joe Nestline, yes. That's Joe Nestline, okay. Tell us about him a little bit. Uh, well, Joe Nestline, uh, I heard about him when I was, you know, on the department. I never uh, had any dealings with him, but uh, older cops, uh, detectives, uh, you know, would tell me about him. So, uh, so an old time uh, mobster, like a, a Damon Runyon-esque kind of character, like Joe Nestline operating in D.C., just, uh, you know, fascinated me. So uh, after I retired, I decided to uh, look into him, uh, into his background and into his life, uh, his connections. And um, the more I looked into it, the more I found and the more fascinating the guy, uh, guy became. He was, um, he was born in D.C. And uh, in 1913, he grew up around the, uh, the Foggy Bottom Foggy Bottom the, area, right? That's where yeah. um, that's where George Washington University is today. In that whole area over there. Yes, yes, and uh, and so it was a whole different area at the time, right? Uh, so well, by the time he became a teenager, uh, the Prohibition era was in full swing, and uh, so that's how he got his start. Uh, um, he graduated from Gonzaga High School in, uh, in D.C. Uh, uh, so he started running. Uh, alcohol, uh, bootleg uh, alcohol uh, between D.C. and Maryland. So uh, prohibition was the law of the land. Uh, but, and, uh, you know, it was enforced in D.C., but it wasn't enforced in Maryland. Maryland was the only state that did not uh, participate, even though it was the law of the land. They Maryland did not participate in them. Maryland didn't have to participate so, in prohibition? Right. It was the law of the land. They just did not enforce it. Oh, I see. OK. Yeah. So there were plenty of stills out in uh, the Maryland suburbs. And so that's what he would do. And uh, so he ran. He worked for uh, a, a gang called the Foggy Bottom Gang. Uh, and he uh, so they uh, and they were bootleggers uh, work uh, out of D.C. And so uh, he would run his uh, car uh on the Thunder Road between D.C. and Maryland uh, with the bootleg uh, alcohol. And then um, one time even in D.C., he crashed and uh, he suffered a head injury, which would uh, haunt him for, for, I guess, the rest of his life. Now, you, uh, were, uh, you were working. You, when did you join the, um, uh, the police department? In 1979. Okay. And, uh, so back then, uh, the city had still... We're still not recovered from uh, the riots of the late 60s, early 70s. So it was, uh, yeah, it, it was a, a fascinating place to work. You were, so 1979, when did you retire? You retired in 19... 2003. 2003, 2003 okay. Yeah, 2003. And were you in so, homicide or what branch in the... Uh, in yeah, the police? Well, I started off uh, in uniform at, at the 3rd District. And then I went to uh, narcotics. Uh, street level, uh, citywide narcotics. We called them jump out squads at the time. And then from there, uh, I went to, uh, I moved up to uh, investigating instead uh, narcotics uh, at a higher level. Uh, and then from from there, uh, uh, I went to the homicide squad, but it was a, a, a task force with the FBI. It was a safe streets task force. So we targeted drug gangs that were responsible for for multiple homicides. Uh, and then from there, I went to uh, went to the intelligence unit uh, doing organized crime and uh, domestic security. And then uh, at the end of my career, I was on the, uh, the Joint Terrorism Task Force with the FBI and other agencies. Uh, so I retired out of the, the Washington field office of the, the JTTF. And you, did you ever get a chance to meet? You heard from the older police officers about Nestline. Did you ever get a chance to meet him? No, I never met him. But what uh, during while I was on that Safe Streets Task Force, 
and we were targeted a specific uh, gang that was responsible for uh, a lot of drugs coming into the city, uh, cocaine, PCP, and heroin. And one of the heroin connections was a, a guy by the name of Langhorn Carter Rohr. They called him Lang. And he was in his 70s by the time he uh, we arrested him as the heroin connection for the street, the, the, the D.C. street gang. So when I was looking into uh, Nestline's background, I found that uh, this guy Lang Rohr was a contemporary of Nestline. They even worked together. Uh, and uh, Nestline ran a, a craps, a floating craps game. Uh, from uh, Maryland all the way down to uh, Hampton, Virginia. And it was quite profitable. And so uh, uh, Lang was one of his um, one of his associates in that craps game and in other uh, uh, endeavors. Right. This, is so, a, was, this was a dice game, basically. And this was the biggest. Uh, you mentioned the book. This I think this is the biggest in the country, correct? In this, whole, in this area. Yeah, well, on the East Coast, yes. Really? Was, wow. Yeah. Yeah. And he... And that's how we made his uh, reputation, really, uh, with that craps game, because he opened clubs, too, in D.C. and in Maryland. And uh, the, the feds and local police uh, kept closing his clubs down. But, uh, you know, so he was I called it I called him the, uh, you know, the floating crap game that he had going between. Uh, it was a cat and mouse game between between the cops and uh, the feds and, and him. So he was always staying one step ahead. Uh, so, uh, he, once he got out of, once prohibition was over, uh, he got into gambling, the numbers game, uh, and craps and stuff. So he worked, he started working at, uh, Jimmy LaFontaine's casino. Uh, it was the Maryland athletic club, but everybody called it Jimmy's place. So this was a casino that was right in, in Bladesburg, right across the DC line. So one entrance went into D.C. And, and another entrance was in Maryland. So it was kind of convenient because each jurisdiction said, well, no, you know, we it's in Maryland. No, it's in D.C. Uh, so he, that's how uh, he played it. But he, he got raided. And so you the, know, whenever complaints were, came in, you know, the cops would raid the place. But. You know, but it operated for for a long time. And he how, was, much, how much? How uh, much? Just to give you an idea about uh, this is um, Nestline and this and his crew, or whoever. How much money were they generating at this time uh, with this oh, craps game and other things? You've got to put oh, a price tag on it. Well, well, really, uh, you know, we're talking about you know a million, a couple of million. Really? Wow. Mm. Yeah, yeah. And uh, and he was uh, Nestline became very well connected because of that. I so, see. but he also he also went out to. He also hooked up with uh, Dino Cellini, uh, another made guy in the, uh, you know, in the mafia. Uh, and, and Dino Cellini's from Steubenville, Ohio. Right. So, yeah. So, uh, so Nestline and, and, uh, and Cellini worked, they worked together at Rex's Cigar Shop in Steubenville, Ohio. Steubenville, Ohio was Las Vegas before there was Las Vegas. <laughs> All the cigar shops there were. Uh, you know, were, were casinos, basically, craps, roulette, you know, whatever. Uh, it was an industrial town, a steel a steel town. And uh, as a matter of fact, Dean Martin got his stuff. Dean Martin's he, right. Yeah, that's uh, Dean Martin's yeah, from there he, and the yeah. other, a few others, yeah. Yeah. I saw I saw a video of Dean Martin. He was singing. It was like a, an old black and white video where he was young Dean Martin. But as he's singing, he's dealing uh, you know, uh, cards at the table, like blackjack table. Right. And you can see <laughs> You can see his skills, ah. you know, with the cards. You, you, you definitely said, you know, he knows what he's doing. Oh yeah. 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 So he yeah. was that, that 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 would be called a mechanic. Dino Cellini was a mechanic. Oh, I see. And so and so was Nestline. You know that they would switch dice in and out of games depending on who's winning too much and stuff like that. And you know they 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 knew what they were doing. Did, was Nestline Italian or was he in? Was he? Uh, no, I, you know what I tried to. Uh, you know, uh, pinned down is ethnicity. Okay, Nestline is uh, is a name that you can't really pin down. So I don't know. He was Catholic because he went to Gonzaga Catholic High School, right? Uh, and so, but he was he was not Italian. So because of that, uh, because of his connections uh, in the nineteen forties, uh, 
because uh, he answered he answered to uh, Meyer Lansky. So Meyer Lansky put this guy Charlie Turin in charge of Nestline. So Charlie Turin was a made guy. He was from Matawan, New Jersey. And he's one you know one of the original old school gangsters for, uh, from before Prohibition. And his nickname so was, uh, was put, his nickname was the Blade, right? Yeah, Charlie the Blade Turin, right? Mm -hmm. And he worked. He worked for. He was kind of an independent player, really. He, he answered to the Genovese, but he also answered to Traficante in Miami, uh, to uh, 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 Richie Boyardo in um, in New Jersey. Uh, you know, so he had uh, he had he was independent, but you know, and he was a, a very trusted guy. He was uh, they described him as a torpedo. He took care of problems around the country. So, but he was so uh, just like Lansky needed uh, uh, Jimmy Blue Eyes Allo as his partner because Lansky was Jewish and not Italian. He needed Allo as his partner and protector. So Nestline needed Turin as his partner and, and protector because uh, yeah. So, so Nestline was a big. He was a Nestline had a real strong connection with Meyer Lansky, and Meyer Lansky was almost like. Um, I guess with a second to Luciano, uh, yes, Charlie Luciano, absolutely. he was one of the major he players. Second, of the mafia, yeah. yeah. So Luciano and Lansky were very close. They were very close. Uh, and uh, because Luciano, that's how Lucky got his name, Lucky. You know, people think that he got his name because he, he survived a vicious beating. And so they called him Lucky Luciano. But his Yiddish friends, when he was a kid, called him, his, la his last name was really Lucania. So his, his Yiddish speaking friends called him Luki. So Luki became lucky. So he was very close to the, uh, the Jewish, Jewish mobsters. And he even set up, well, I'm, you know, if you know the, the history of what Luciano did, he set up, you know, after a long drawn out war, um, the Castel de Marese war, he set up the commission, uh, which was the top. And that, that was, it was all Italian. Then under the commission, there's the syndicate. And that was, you know, Italians and Jews and other ethnic groups. And uh, so that was the hierarchy. But the last word was the commission. They, they had the last word on everything. And um, Nestline attended so, those commission. Uh, you, had, you mentioned in the book, too, that they had these commission meetings. Uh, Appalachia is most famous for it. And you might, we saw kind of a glimpse of that, I guess, with the Godfather, when they have that sit down right. uh, with all the top. Uh, and Nestline right. would be at those meetings, apparently. You, you mentioned in the book because you're so connected to Meyer Lansky. Right, right. So uh, Nestline started uh, sitting in. He didn't sit in on, you know, the big meetings like the the lost uh, the Havana meeting or the Appalachian meeting or the or the Atlantic City me meeting. Uh, but when the mob lost Cuba, uh, the mob needed, you know, to branch out, and so Nestline and uh, and Turin were pretty much Luciano and uh, and Lansky's emissaries into the Caribbean, into the Bahamas, uh, uh, Antigua. You know, they're the ones that went out and uh, along with other people uh, to uh, to, you know, expand into the Caribbean since they lost, you know, the money making stream from Cuba, which was, you know, bigger than Vegas. Uh, they needed a new uh, stream of uh, income. So they branched out into the Caribbean and then ultimately into uh, Europe and then uh, uh, down uh, into London and Europe uh, and even into the Middle East. Uh, so, and so among others, Torin and, and Nestline were the Lansky and Luciano's emissaries uh, to get, get the ball rolling in those areas. That's fascinating. Yeah, that's fascinating. Yeah. You mentioned also, too, you know, people have a tough time uh, believing that we could have a, a, a mafia here in the District of Columbia because this is where, you know, the FBI is located, the Secret Service, right. uh, the U.S. Marshals. Right. Uh, but you mentioned the book that uh, D.C. was always kind of a crime capital uh, going back to the time of the Civil yeah. War. Whatever. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, prostitution and and gambling were big in DC from from the very beginning. I, you know, I write in the book that uh, the, uh, the 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 Jamestown, uh, the Virginia Company of London, you know, uh, raised funds by having a lottery, 
you know, to raise funds for Jamestown, the first uh, English settlement on, uh, here in, uh, in North America, uh, or in America. Uh, so, and then the, uh, after the after the revolution uh, and after the War of 1812, you know, when the British sacked uh, D.C., uh, the government came up with another lottery to raise money to, uh, uh, you know, fund the, the, you know, the reconstruction to, and, and, and expand uh, the capital, the nation's capital. Uh, unfortunately, the guy they hired uh, absconded with the money. <laughs> so, you know, the, the jackpot was like $100,000, but he was never to be seen again. So there's that. And then, you know, and then I go into, uh, uh, I talk about Jackson City. Jackson I City, you, I was going to ask you about yeah, that. that yeah. Was, yeah, that was, uh, so that's another, uh, another uh, Northern Virginia, Arlington and Alexandria in, in the beginning were part of the District of Columbia. Right, right, right. Uh, they were, as far as so, uh, uh, the government took 31 uh, square miles of Virginia and 69 square miles of Maryland. And Virginia all, always wanted it back. So in 1846, they got it back. But in the meantime, while it was part of the District of Columbia, these New York investors came down and wanted to build uh, a city because, you know, the District of Columbia was there was Washington City and then there was Georgetown and then there was Alexandria, which was part of the encompassed of, in the District of Columbia. So uh, these investors wanted to make a new city called Jackson City, named after Andrew Jackson, who was the president at the time. So that's another uh, fiasco because they they had a groundbreaking ceremony. They laid a cornerstone with all kinds of uh, newspaper articles, medals, coins, and everything, uh, and a big ceremony with uh, George Washington's uh, step-grandson, uh, 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 so they wanted a city, they wanted Jackson City next to Washington City, two great cities. They thought they would be one of the great cities of the world, which, ne which never happened. Uh, so it just floundered, the city floundered. Then uh, after the Civil War, uh, uh, and, and when uh, Virginia had, had it, Alexandria back and everything, uh, they decided to, uh, New Jersey investors now decided to open up gambling. So make it like a uh, Monte Carlo on the Potomac. <laughs> and again, that was another fiasco. But the thing with, with that city, it finally, you know, just disappeared off the, literally off the face of the, the face of the map. Sure. And, uh, but the, the, the one thing that came out of, Jackson City was that guy, Jimmy LaFontaine. Jimmy LaFontaine started his career in Jackson City. So then when that went uh, defunct, he moved his the operation to uh, Bladensburg. And, and that lasted up until uh, the 1940s. So from well, Jackson, the City, Jackson point, City had casinos and had a racetrack, I think. You're casinos right. and racetracks. That's Amazing. right. That's right. Yeah. But it was also... Uh, it was also uh, crime ridden. You know, farmers couldn't uh, would, would get robbed. You know, they uh, uh, they were highway they were highwaymen to to rob uh, farmers or other merchants going to market. Uh, so it, and it was also fire trap. Uh, there was constantly fires and stuff there. So it, it was just it was just a, um, a yeah complete uh, a complete failure. Uh, um, was, there, was this like yes. uh, in Crystal City, I guess, nowadays would be where it would, was located? Yes, uh, yes. It's, where, uh, it's where the Pentagon, Pentagon yeah. Been, uh, yeah, Crystal City, that area. Well, that's amazing. Mm -hmm. That's amazing, yeah. You also yeah. mentioned how the, uh, you know, the nickname for prostitutes are hookers, and that also came from Washington, D.C. Yeah. <laughs> well, tell yes, us about that. Did, because, yeah. Uh, Okay, well, the, the Union suffered a defeat over there at the, the, the Battle of Bull Run, about 30 miles uh, uh, south of Washington, D.C. and Virginia. So McClellan ordered General uh, Joseph Hooker to, uh, to Washington, D.C. with his troops to protect the, the president and the city from further Confederate incursion. So, but there was already plenty of prostitution going on in, in the city. Uh, so as a matter of fact, the... Uh, uh, the, the area is uh, the federal is where, where the federal triangle is now. At the time, it was called Murder Bay, huh. and there was uh, and um, and it was 
plenty of prostitution there. And of course, General Hooker, uh, he, 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 you know, he was he a ladies man. He was a ladies man, exactly. Right. And so, so you know, he he got his men, you know, disciplined while they were on duty. But in off duty hours, they were gambling and going to the prostitutes. And so McClellan ordered, you know, um, Hooker to, you know, to get to get his men under control. So what he did was he rounded up all the prostitutes and put them in in one section. OK. And and the, the women who wouldn't cooperate were, you know, rounded up and, and basically <laughs> deported out of D.C. They were sent to New Jersey <laughs> on, on a steamship. And the name of the town was Love Ladies, New Jersey. Which, <laughs> that's Wait, a great that's name. But anyway, yeah. So over time, uh, the Murder Bay became known as uh, Hooker's Brigade. Hooker's uh, Brigade. Yeah, or, or Hooker's, yeah. No, Hooker's Division. That's <laughs> where the prostitutes who all were in one spot. And mm -hmm. the ladies themselves were known as Hooker's Brigade. So the area was Hooker's Division. The prostitutes themselves were Hooker's Brigade. Brigade, unbelievable, and uh, so that name just uh, stuck. That stuck, and, uh, yeah, sure, mm -hmm. yeah. And they're hookers. Amazing. And now the other thing about Joe Joseph um, Hooker, he he frequented uh, one bordello in particular, and it was called the Haystack. Now the woman, the madam that ran the name, her name was Bella Hay, and so her, her bordello was called the Haystack, and that's where you know he spent his time, and unknown to anybody. Uh, Bella Hay was a spy for the Confederacy. Huh. Yeah. So anyway, so I just so that's and so that's this is also the term where a roll in the hay comes. <laughs> so if you enjoy a roll in the hay, right? <laughs> Dan Cooker and the Madame Bella Hay. There you go. <laughs> That's amazing. That's it's, it's quite fascinating. And that's what the whole thing I love about the book. You have so much information here about just uh, uh, the criminal uh, nefarious elements of it all throughout yes. the whole city and how Nestline was. This this person was in the center of it all, really. It was just connected was. to everything. Yeah, it was really quite amazing. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Yeah. And, yeah. and also, um, you know that, you know, the mafia had uh, neutral cities. Okay. And Washington, D.C. became one of those neutral cities. So you had uh, Saratoga Springs, New York. You had Hot Springs, Arkansas. You had Las Vegas. You had uh, uh, Miami, uh, Atlantic City. These were all neutral cities where... The mob controlled, but not one particular family controlled it. And also, there was no uh, violence in these uh, in these cities because it was, uh, you know, a money making tourist areas. So, you know, the gunplay was uh, was banned. So, uh, so when I say uh, so, yeah, DC became a neutral city, really because, you know, the FBI was there, the Secret Service, you know, and also because. The best, uh, the best reason I heard about DC not the mob not really fully, you know, uh, controlling Washington DC uh, was the fact that that DC at the time was controlled by Congress. So at the time you had uh, what do you have? Ninety six senators, you know, four hundred and thirty five uh, representatives. So that was too many people to bribe in one city. So D.C. became, you know, a kind of a neutral city. And there was even a meeting at the Shoreham Hotel uh, between uh, uh, Luciano and representatives from Chicago and uh, uh, Detroit. And they were there, uh, you know, at a mob meeting at the, the blue room of the, of the Sheraton Hotel, or the, the Shoreham Hotel, sorry. Uh, and this guy, Harry Ansinger, if you know that name, he was the bureau. He was the uh, the head of the Bureau of Narcotics. Mm, yeah, yeah. He was part of the Treasury. So he got wind of this meeting and he went there and he called Luciano out. And, you know, uh, Luciano was offended. He says, we're not, you know, we're not doing anything. You know, we have rights. Uh, we're just here, you know, having uh, a meeting. And so, uh, and, he, and they had, of course, uh, escorts with them, females escorts. Uh, uh, accompanying them and uh, so Angsliger said well that's all you better be doing because remember the Man Act so he was threatening Luciano with the Man Act you know uh, taking right, transporting the, women yeah, across state lines yeah. Yeah, across the so but anyway so this meeting was to, to decide the fate of 
Machine Gun Jack McGurn. So Machine Gun was, uh, his real name was Antonio Gabaldi, Italian guy. And so he was, uh, he was a hit man for Al Capone and he was Al Capone's favorite, you know, lieutenant. But he was also getting out of hand. He was a drunk. And uh, so uh, he he uh, he beat up Joe E. Lewis. I don't know if you know that name. Joe E. Lewis was an old time comedian from the old, you know, the old clubs and stuff that the mob had. So uh, Joe E. Lewis was performing at the uh, at a club on the north side, uh, which was controlled by Capone. So once his contract. The Joey Lewis contract was over. He got an offer to go to the South Side, which I think was controlled by. Muggins. This is in Chicago, yeah. right? This is in Chicago. It's all right? Chicago, right? Yeah, right. So McGurn, so uh, Joey Lewis was a popular attraction, and he brought in a lot of you know money for the club. The Green Mill it was called the Green Mill. The club still there in Chicago. It's the oldest uh, uh, continuing uh, saloon, uh, I think, in the country. The Green Mill, uh, and so. He got threatened. Joey Lewis got threatened by uh, by McGurn. So some time passed. His contract expired, and he went over to the South Side. It was called the Rendezvous. The South Side Club was called the Rendezvous. So he went there. He performed, and in the performance, he kind of ridiculed McGurn, you know, because he thought he was bluffing and it was well. He was, you know, after a couple of weeks or so, he gets a knock on his on the door of his hotel room. These guys come busting in. And they they beat him to what they thought they were doing. They're beating him to death. They cut him right. up. They sliced his face. They sliced his tongue. Yeah. They just left. They just left him for dead. Uh, but he didn't die. He managed to. When they left, he managed to crawl out, and the, a chambermaid found him. Mm. And he got so Al Capone paid all his uh, his uh, medical bills and everything right. because he was Al Capone's favorite entertainer. But uh, yeah, Joey Lewis never. Uh, never identified McGurn as the perpetrator. There were two other guys. As a matter of fact, one of them was Sam John Connor. Was oh. was was one of them that, uh, and then another guy by the name of uh, Needles, Needles something. Another, but he was Italian too. But I forget his name. So yeah, they really worked them over. Uh, but that's why that's what the meeting in D.C. was about to, to decide uh, McGurn's fate, and it was decided. They actually, they actually, uh, yeah, they killed him at a bowling alley in Chicago. Mm. Uh, and that, that's a, you know, he should have known better because, you know, doing that, uh, an act of violence that unsanctioned was a no-no. You know, you, you just don't do that, especially if it was Al Capone's favorite, you know? Yeah, sure. So, uh, yeah. But anyway, so that's my story about uh, D.C. being a, a neutral town. That's amazing. Yeah, it's just, uh, you have so much... Uh, 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 it's just loaded with this kind of. Um, I mean, what you're sharing with us today, just some of just, just some of the anecdotes you have in here. So much is uh, is included. Um, you know, this is the um, the 50th anniversary of uh, the Watergate, and yeah. you also, uh, yeah, you you uh, tell us a little bit about that. You were kind of you know the uh, detectives, and you mentioned the Watergate burglars and some other things in the yeah. book as well. Yeah, uh, yeah, I knew the, the 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 well, I knew the the three detectives, but I was closer to. Uh, Carl Schaffler. Uh, he was uh, uh, an intelligence uh, detective. Um, I got to know him and met him, you know, when I was a rookie. Uh, but then I really got to know him. Uh, I was still on the department, but he retired and went. He was arson investigator and intelligence uh, guy for the the uh, Prince George's Fire Department. So every time I would go see him, he was constantly on the phone with uh, some author of a book and he had all these books lined there. He was even talking to this guy uh, uh, who killed who, uh, this um, Iranian, well, he was a, a black American, but he assassinated a guy in Montgomery County uh, at the behest of the Iranian uh, mullahs. Oh. Uh, then he fled to Iran and, and uh, Schaffler was always on the phone trying to convince the guy to come back and yeah. uh, to America. Uh, but that, that's the kind of a guy he was. He kept, uh, uh, he, ha he, he was very smart. And, um, but he's the one that, uh, him and, uh, and two other detectives are the ones that arrested the Watergate burglars. Uh, one of them was, uh, uh, well, you know, all the Watergate burglars. Um, 
And but the thing about that is that Joe Nestline had a uh, a courier, basically. Her name was Heidi Reichen. Now yeah. Heidi Reichen, yeah, Heidi Reichen was his uh, money courier, but she started out as his kind of like uh, at, uh, in his gambling operation because she was a party girl. And she knew all the football players and stuff and all the sports people. And she would gather intelligence for Nestline's gambling operation or sports book and stuff like that. So, but she's, and then she started the, she had her own uh, call girl operation out of the uh, Columbia Plaza Hotel, which was close to the Watergate. And and that's, you know, uh, McCord, you know, uh, McCord. Yeah, Charles McCord, yeah. Yeah, he was the CIA guy. So he was the CIA guy. But he was still a contractor for the CIA and he was still using uh, Heidi Reichen's call girls, uh, you know, for blackmail and stuff right, like that. Right, 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 right. They've always been doing. So, um, yeah, so and that was uh, that was Nestline and, uh, and Heidi Reichen's uh, operation. And uh, so the reason, well, according to G. Gordon Liddy, uh, the reason for the burglary was they wanted to know whose names was on the list of these, of these call, uh, for these call girls who was frequenting these. And they wanted to make sure that they wanted to see if anybody in the Nixon administration wa- was, uh, on a list of names. Oh, there. I see. Yeah. So, so according to G Gordon league, that was the purpose of the break in to, to, to gather information. And, uh, uh, yeah. So, you know, there were plenty of names on, on that, uh, on that list in Heidi's uh, black book. I mean, you know, oh, all God, sure, yeah. Yeah. yeah, you know, between the politicians and the, and uh, the Washington Redskins and uh, the Green Bay Packers and, uh, you know, the team owners. I mean, you know, uh, yeah. So it was that endless, was, yeah. Yeah. It was endless, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That was like one of they had a bunch of there were actually uh, several break-ins that were they were doing back then. I mean, Watergate's yeah, the most yeah. famous of, but they had others that were going on as well. There were, there were others, yeah. It was the same thing. They were they were looking for you know, incrimi- you know, political information and criminal uh, incriminating information. What the other side had on them. Uh, so yeah, it was it was a complicated uh, uh, situation. Um, right. Whatever happened? What what? That line passed away. When did he pass away? Um, Nestline passed away in 1995. All right. He, he, I believe, yeah, he was, I believe he was 82 years old. Okay. And he was in a, in a nursing home in, uh, in Delaware. Mm. Uh, yeah. And, but he stayed, he stayed in the, with, he was always, he, he didn't spend too much time in jail, but he was always within the criminal justice system, even up in, into the 80s, into the 1980s. Uh, so, you know, because of, because of his connections, uh, he, he was actually going to take over his, he was being groomed to take over from Lansky. That oh, was, really? in, that, that mm. was in an FBI report. I found mm. that uh, Nestline was being groomed to take over from Meyer Lansky when Meyer Lansky passed away. Uh, but because of, uh, 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 Bobby Kennedy and all the, uh, the, uh, McClellan, uh, commission and the Key Faber commission and. So that that never that never came to pass. Uh, amazing, so, uh, yeah, yeah. What amazing! Well, I, I tell you, it's it's just it's an it's an amazing book. We're gonna have to have you come on again. It's just uh, here it is, folks. Uh, uh, Mafia Bagman: The Life and Times of a DC Mobster by um, Detective Angelo Parisi, retired detective. And um, it's just uh, all kinds of information is loaded here. Just of all kinds of connections, just with the. Uh, with, with organized crime, regular crime, with um, oh, yeah. just all kinds of things happening. You know, if you mentioned the, mentioned the Watergate, oh, yeah. there's other things uh, oh. that he was connected with, and it's just a it's a fascinating uh, story oh, yeah. about uh, about oh, Washington. Yeah. yeah, right, yeah. Even when he was, you know, older, and he got caught up in a in a uh, a sting operation by the FBI. It was called Vidcam. Vidcam. You know, uh, the person that was a, that uh, a New Jersey guy. Uh, who vetted Nestline before he got into the into a deal with Nestline? You know, he would ask. He was asking around to all the old timers. You know, what do you think about Nestline? And everybody said, "Oh yeah, don't worry about Nestline. You know, he's a he's a stand up guy. You don't have to worry about that." 
But, you know, by then he was, you know, older. He wasn't, he's not as sharp as he used to be. And he got caught up uh, uh, in the stain. Nice. Uh, yeah. And he also got, uh, he got caught up with uh, the Alcy uh, Hastings, uh, the, the, the judge that was uh, impeached right. in Florida. Yeah. And that's only, that's only because he, you know, everybody who came, all these gangsters and stuff, they came to D.C. to testify in front of one commission or another, stayed with Nestline, huh. you know. So, uh, you know, uh, so there was, you know, Traficante, uh, Milwaukee Phil Alderizio, you know, uh, you know, whenever, whenever somebody was in town to go testify, instead of going to a hotel, they'll stay with, they, they stayed with Joe. <laughs> so that's, t- yeah, that's the kind of uh, reputation he had. He had a lot of influence and he had a lot of power, that's for sure. Yeah, he did. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and he traveled the world on, with cash. He never had a bank account. He never had a credit card. Everything was cash and carry, and he traveled the world. Uh, and um, yeah, so I don't know how he did it, but you know, he uh, he, he did it. And I kind of have a kind of have a respect for guys like that who oh you know, yeah live, sure yeah who live by their wits. You know, yes. they, what, what they even though uh, Toreen was was absolutely illiterate, he couldn't he couldn't even read. Read how about but, that? Man? But but he but he traveled the world. He ran casinos and. Uh, in Europe, uh, London, the Netherlands, you know, the, the Bahamas. You that's know, incredible. You, you, yeah, it is. Amazing. Well, that's great. Are you working on another book at all? or? Um... Yeah, I got, well, with all, with the information, just like when I was working as a police officer, you you gather information on one, one group of one crew, one gang, and then you take that gang down. But then you've got all this leftover intelligence, so you use that to go to the next case. So with all the stuff I gathered on Nestline and all the peripheral people he dealt with, uh, yeah, I'm working on a, That's it's, great. Not, it's not a sequel to this book, but it's uh, it's all the information, leftover information. I found. Is it going to be here in D.C. or is it going to be in another location? No, it's going it's to be... Um, uh, nationwide, I would say. Oh, okay, cool. Well, that's, the book does talk a lot about because um, we are the nation's capital. You do yeah. bring up a number of facts uh, about how uh, some of the criminals, uh, the criminal connections, were nationwide in different parts of the country and different oh, parts sure. of the of the area, which oh, I thought yeah. was very interesting as well. Also, yeah, yeah. sure. Right. Well, I want to thank you very much for being here today. And again, no, folks, thank uh, you. Mafia Bagman, and I have links to it. Uh, a fascinating book, and if you live here in the um, in the Washington, D.C. metropolitan region. This is really a must-read for you because there's so many um, enlightening uh, facts, anecdotes. And I wouldn't be surprised if a lot of the places you mentioned are still here yeah. or relatively here. You know, you can at least, you know, oh, yeah. some yeah. of the places, oh, yeah. Still, yeah, the speakeasy is still, still here. Uh, well, some you know, some of them are not speakeasy anymore. They're legitimate uh, businesses, bars right. and stuff, businesses. Yeah, the tune-in, uh, the... Uh, Zebby's Garden, the May the Mayflower, not the hotel, but the Mayflower Bar. Uh, yeah, these were all these were all speakeasies, and uh, uh, you know, at the time, um, yeah. So though they're still they're still there. Fantastic, uh, fascinating, fascinating book. Well, I appreciate it. Well, thank you very much for being here today. Okay. we'll have to thank talk you. to you again. You bet. Thank you. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank you. Bye.